Welcome to Almost Heretical. Got an interesting question today that many listeners are asking. We did our uh, producer's call, Zoom call, last night. And if you want to be a part of that, go to patreon.com slash almost heretical and just choose the producer uh, tier. And we'd love to have you on those calls to help shape the future of Almost Heretical. But the question was, and this is what we're going to talk about today as we talk about Noah. I'm going to read the question in the form of an email that we got from someone named Haley. Haley says, hi, Shelby and Nate. Let me start by saying I'm very grateful for both of you hosting Almost Radical Podcast. I finally feel like I'm making progress on figuring out a lot of unanswered questions I've had for a while and feel the support that I'm not alone on this journey as someone who is still trying to cling on to some type of hope after realizing so many of my views are almost opposite of what I learned in the Southern Baptist Church I grew up in. Okay, here's the question. I found the Canon series, Woman series, Hell and Heaven series, and a few others, all really helpful in understanding the Bible. Maybe I haven't reached a podcast where you talk about this yet. You have now. <laughs> or I missed something along the way, but I can't figure out what the conclusion is to all of this. If the Bible is a set of scripts at the end of the day and not the infallible word of God, and if the Bible maintains patriarchal culture, and if there are different interpretations of hell, what left is useful in the Bible? And she that goes on, is, that but the question, that's the question. That's the question people were asking on the producer's Zoom call last night that we did for the show. It's the question that we get in email form many times uh, a month. And here's the question now from Haley. So that's what we're going to talk about today as we look at Noah and the flood. And really talking about Noah as we're moving through our kind of through the Bible series and we've reached um, Genesis 6 through 9, um, it really is a perfect I think microcosm to talk about uh, this question because it, it's got, it's got the good and the bad. Like it's, I mean, we're pretty familiar. I think at this point, most of us with the, the horrifying nature of the Noah story that we maybe weren't really um, exposed to as, as children. Uh, but it also has, you know, the, something about it that feels maybe comfortable and like uh, almost nostalgic of like the rainbow and the right. you know the animals. So so it's got it's 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 like a, a yeah like I said a little microcosm of the whole Bible maybe in a sense. Raise your um, hand so. if you're a listener out there who had Noah's Ark, the animals, the ark, something about this story on let's say a a nursery wall in yeah. um, well your own nursery, your own um, you know baby mm. room or something. But at the church, right in the nursery in the church or the library in the church or, or some space in a church building or a home where there was there a kind of a cutesy looking picture precious moments the, precious Ark. moments right yeah, yeah. so yeah, yeah raise your hand send an email moments cross stitch of noah's ark on our mm. on our bedroom wall as babies it's i mean what how i don't know how this story got be to become a children's story but i think it must just be because there's animals involved right and as my friend, Francis Chan, who I worked with for years, uh, used to say, they never show the <laughs> the animals and the people like drowning <laughs> down in the water. They never paint that on the uh, Sunday school wall, right? Yeah, we're actually talking about the story in the, um, the patron Facebook group right now, which is also something you can be a part of at patreon.com. But um, so I asked before with this episode of like, hey, anybody like what were your thoughts or experiences or questions around the Noah story? And oh, man, some of them are just horrific of like people being taught um, literally in Sunday school, like narrating that, you know, outside the, the ark. They're like, you can hear the screams of the people who Ooh. regretted their dis decisions. And then, you know, the screams are silenced. And it's just like, oh, man. But I mean, I mean, that is what the story, you know, is incorporated. So, I mean, I think, like I said, a lot of us have gotten to the point of realizing how horrifying um, the story is. But what I want to do today, like that's not new information. Um, so, what I want to do today is actually talk about it, not in a sense of, you know, this is why this is actually a great story, but to hopefully understand that the things that we find horrifying about it were never meant to be the focus. And ultimately, um, come to hopefully answer that question that Haley asked um, and that so many people are asking of if these things didn't literally happen and are harmful stories, some of them, why, why do we still, why is there any value left? Okay. So let me give you the, 
the rundown of the story as I remember it from Sunday school and church. And did Veggie Tales do this? I don't think okay, they. I don't they think how so. could you not do Noah's Ark? But anyways, I think they didn't. Um, maybe they didn't want to touch this one because of the the death. Maybe toll. there was just no good way to animate it. Yeah. Okay, so there is a man named Noah. God comes to Noah. I can't quite remember how, but God comes to Noah and says, I am I am upset at the wickedness on the earth, and I am going to wipe out everyone on the earth. But I will save your family if you build this ark. Do as I say, you know. So even though it has never rained before, a great flood is coming. Build an ark, get your family on there, take two of every kind of animal, a male and a female, and I will protect you and I will save you, but everyone else will die. And Noah builds this ark over the course of 40 years. Is that is that right? Many years. Oh, I can't remember. Many years. And no flood, no rain, but he keeps building. And uh, eventually the rains came drip, down drop, and the drip, floods drop, came drip, up. Drop, drip, drop, drip, drop. <laughs> Did you know that song? The rains came down oh, yeah. and the floods came up. Yeah, but and that's a different story. That's just about the wise man built his house. Oh, it is. It, that's true. It is. <laughs> well, it works. Uh, and they get on the ark and God seals the door. And then they float around for a while. Well, everyone else is being killed. And after 40 days and 40 nights, there's the 40, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. they, he sends a dove or something else for, anyway, it's a dove brings back a, doesn't bring back anything back, to, but the bird comes back. So they know that there's no land yet. Then they send it again and it brings back a, a branch. And then they know that there is dry ground. And so that's sort of the, it comes to rest on a mountain and people have been looking for that ark ever since. And then they get off and right. they worship God and God Populate makes covenant. With the rainbow says, I will never I again the rainbow, flood the yeah. earth. Yeah. Okay, yeah, that's the yeah. story. That, and they pop, they repopulate the earth. Retelling. Yeah. And then we quickly find out that there are other people that are <laughs> still around, uh, which is kind of interesting. Yeah. And that that and there starts the whole problem. Yeah, so that was one of the first things people started bringing up in the Facebook group and on our call last night was, well, you know, we talked about the Nephilim in the last episode, these kind of... Uh, hybrid creatures who live on the earth and then supposedly and they are actually kind of attributed with the wickedness that then god is you know wanting to destroy everything so god in the story destroys everything and then like a couple chapters later you're hearing about the nephilim again and so you're like wait what i thought we just shouldn't the only people alive at this point be noah and his descendants um which is your first clue that this we we have been taught and have been taught to take this story more literally than the readers uh, originally intended and the writers intended. Um, so, and, and yeah, the fact that boom, the Nephilim are back just goes to show that like not actually everyone was destroyed in the same way that when you read later in the old Testament, you know, things, uh, the conquests of Israel, where it says, and they, they destroyed everything. They left no one alive of, you know, certain cities um, that they're going and attacking. And then a few chapters later, you'll read about, you know, okay. And then the, you know, no, then the, and then the Ammonites, you know, such and such and such. And you're like, I thought there were none left alive. There's a lot of hyperbole at play in um, in these texts. It's conquest so literature, right? It's conquest um, writing, and it's the right. way you you spoke. People would have realized that at the time that this is not. Uh, so wait, so how many people were? How many people lived? Right. Okay, it's none? like if okay. you know, with a football team, if you go, we absolutely obliterated them. The other team, right? Like it's like it's it's just. That's just the way you talk. Yeah, the New England Patriots still exist. Um, <laughs> yeah. They're doing fine. They're doing great. Uh, but they they took a beating on the field. Yeah, but not literally. <laughs> you just right. did it again. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> there you go. Um, so anyway, the most important thing to know, I'd say, about this story is that it is not original, um, meaning like not even not even that there's other versions of the Noah story, but there are other versions of this story that far far predate. Um, Noah. The, the flood narrative is something that we see in many other cultures for many centuries before Noah. So, first of all, one of the oldest is the uh, Sumerian flood 
story. That's, I mean, probably 1,500 years before um, the, hmm. the Genesis flood story is written. So we're talking, I mean, that's almost, I mean, imagine what was happening, you know, 1,500 years before now. Like, it, we're in the, the year 500 A.D., I think that's just so long ago. So think of just the difference. Like the story has been around forever, but not just that one. The um, Atrahasis epic is a pretty well-studied one. It's from um, the Babylonian culture from probably the 18th century BC. So around 1,000 to 800 years before um, probably the Noah story was written. Uh, the Epic of Gilgamesh, a lot of people have probably heard about this. Uh, it's a Mesopotamian story that was probably written around the 12th century um, BC. And then finally we get to the Noah story, which is probably written earliest being around the 10th century BC or um, or later. So all of those, the, the three that we just mentioned, the Sumerian, the Babylonian, and the Mesopotamian versions of this story existed for centuries, nearly a millennia before um, before the Noah version. So a, a big flood happened. Something happened. People had something Some, to write about, you know? Yeah. So clearly there's, and I mean, as you'll, we'll find out, like there are flood narratives also in Native American cultures and Correct. there's a flood narrative in Hindu cultures. So yeah, it's clearly there was some kind of large flood or maybe multiple large floods um, that, that started the story, right? Right. May be connected, they may not be connected to each other, right? Because you have one, uh, a Native American one would have been North America, and then you have some of these other ones that are happening in kind of the Middle East. So it, that would that would start to talk about a worldwide flood t- to some degree if it's covering multiple continents like that, um, which there's not scientific backing for. So they, there could yeah, be... Yeah, that's another important point that I wanted to bring up is many of us were taught some very detailed archaeological um, evidence from probably answers in Genesis that, uh, we, you know, we were taught to believe that this is archaeologically provable, that there was a, a, a global flood, but there really is no um, proof of that. Some of the arguments were, people were talking about this in the Facebook group too, I think some of the arguments were like, you know, when there's a global flood, it puts so much pressure on things that it made the rocks appear to be older than they are. That was like a way to combat you know, the age of the earth arguments. Um, but a lot of that just doesn't isn't actually scientifically accurate. So no, there's no actual proof of a global flood, but there are is plenty of proof for many large local floods. There is a um, comet theory. And, if we want to go down this, people say go down the rabbit holes. Go down the rabbit holes. There's a a comet theory that talks about a potentially a three mile wide comet that crashed into Earth around five thousand years ago. Would would have not just caused a, a flood, but obviously widespread devastation. Um, potentially 600 foot high tsunamis and storms. So that could have potentially Absolutely. made its way onto multiple continents. Does it cover, yeah. is it the picture that we're picturing where I was pictured as a kid, like you zoom out and you're looking at the whole globe the whole spinning world around is water. and it's blue. The whole thing is blue yeah. mm-hmm. and covering, you know, we all know how tall Mount Everest is and it says that it covers even the highest mountains, right? So it's like, okay, this is at least 28,000 feet high <laughs> which is you it's know where airplanes rain. fly almost right um <laughs> did that happen no no is and that the point of the story no no and for a lot of people i think it's really really hard to get out of the mentality of um like when we say this did not happen like that can that i think still sounds threatening and like disappointing for a lot of us um, because we're just so programmed to, to believe that these stories are, are literal things and programmed to believe that what we know about God is because of what God supposedly did in these moments. And so, so if we don't you know, have those stories anymore, then what do we know about God? Which is a fair thing to, to ask. Yes. And we were told that is the point of the story. And mm-hmm. so when you take away that point, like everyone is asking, is there anything left here? And so to a lot of people who that is the only point of this story is to prove that God is real, right? And that God right. is all powerful. And then you take that away from me. Well, now you're just saying this doesn't matter at all. And look at you progressives out there, once again, trying to take a pen to the Bible and cross out parts of the Bible that you don't like and that don't you know fit with your narrative and then don't prove what you wanted to prove. 
Yeah. And I think we know we're missing something because of what we talked about earlier, which is there's a lot of clues that the the original readers and writers didn't see these as literal stories. And yet they clearly found them incredibly valuable and passed them on. So what is it about us as modern readers that we, we don't find value in something once it's no longer something that really happened. And it's really hard to be given a new meaning for something and have it feel as significant as the meaning that you had before. Mm -hmm. Even if it yeah, is... Yeah, when the meaning we had before was, you know, I mean, it was so, so incredibly powerful and huge and meaningful. So then, yeah, presenting anything feels smaller than that. So just know that going into this, depending on where you land on this, we have listeners all over the map uh, from... They don't no longer call themselves a Christian to they are still pastors at churches. Uh, that is how wide the almost heretical audience is. So if you find yourself more in that world of like, wait, what are you saying about Noah's Ark? Just know that being handed a different meaning and trying to align ourselves as closely with possibly the meaning that the original readers would have and writers would have had, it's going to feel like you're losing something. It just will. Until you come back around. And if you've listened back um, into some of our series, I've talked about this cycle before where um, something, you feel like you're losing something. You learn some new fact. Say for today, it might be like the Noah story was never meant to be literal. It didn't really happen. And it feels like you're losing something right there. And then slowly you go, okay, well, I can maybe see where there might be some meaning involved. And then you're like, actually, yeah, this is still like, I see the point of the story. And then you might get to the point of like, this is actually still something valuable that I want to pass on. I mean, we'll get there maybe. But, and then, and so that's, a, it's a cycle that I've often experienced in my life too, of a feeling like I've lost something to coming around and realizing I've actually maybe gained something a lot better and a lot more stable and healthy. Yeah. So yeah, well, I want to get back to the the, the flood narratives because I just find this really interesting. The the various cultures and just to to sh prove to you just how much Noah is really a um, a later version of an older story. So in where well, I'm going to focus on the three versions: the Atrahasis epic, the Epic of Gilgamesh, and the Genesis version. Those are probably the most um, the ones with the most research behind them. In all three of those stories, there's a catastrophic flood event that threatens to destroy all of humanity. Um, the, in all three of them, the protagonists, which is Noah or Utnapishtim or Atrahasif, Atrahasis, they are all warned about the impending flood by some divine being. Um, they are all instructed to build a large boat or an ark to survive the flood. In each of the narratives, the construction details are provided, like what kind of materials and dimensions and everything. Wow, really? Yeah. Um, in each of the stories, animals are also saved, and the protagonists are instructed to bring them in pairs to ensure the survival of the different species. And after the floods recede, um, all three narratives have a bird that's sent out to determine whether the land is habitable or not. So you can see that just... I mean, basically all the main elements are the same. Hmm. I Yeah, that was more than I thought, right? I haven't looked into this. I haven't researched this like you have. That was more than I thought lined up. I thought it was like, they all talked about, there was a lot of water on the earth at one point uh, in, in a specific period. And what are we going to do about this flood? That, so I thought it was just like that. Like they all have an answer to this flood that happened and some narrative around it. I did not know that it was, it lined up that, um, perfectly with these details, even like the construction details being a part of the story. That's wild. Yep. So I I think of it as a bit like um we we I ran this analogy by the group last night on our um, patron call, our producer call, and they said go with it. I think of it a bit like the Cinderella story, like the movie with Hilary Duff. Um, the Cinderella. No one's seen this. You haven't this. seen it, but <laughs> I, I think more people, probably more of the girls have seen this if you were a girl in the 90s, 2000s. Um, but it's it's like as if we were to say that that version of the Cinderella story is the original, like that is the ultimate Cinderella and the only and the main and the, or the literal version. You get to a point in history, let's say in a thousand years, all the other Cinderella stories for some reason have been destroyed or fallen away and that's the only one you have that's the only story you have and so you start to go like okay you'd be like wow what an amazing story like somebody created this and you would have no idea that it's 
absolutely based on things that were probably far more widespread than it. Mm, right. so, I mean, yeah, the Cinderella goes back all the way to the Grimm brothers, I think. And then, I mean, the Disney Cinderella, we would probably all agree, is a way more influential version than Hilary Duff's. And yet, yeah, if you if that's the only one that you grew up with, you never heard of the Disney princess, all you had was the Cinderella story, um, then that would really affect how you see or Maiden Manhattan, we could do that one too. There's there's so many versions of Cinderella. Right. And there's a many there's many that do not say this is this is a story of Cinderella, but are following the same rags to riches type of story. We even use that mm-hmm. in sports. Ah, we, I like how we've come back to sports twice in this episode already. <laughs> I mean, it is uh, the Super Bowl week here in 2024. Um, and Taylor Swift won. So, <laughs> but there's, we use that in sports. We say, this was a real Cinderella story. A team that was mm-hmm. not at the beginning of the season projected to do much or anything. And they went on to win the championship. It's the Cinderella story. Yeah. The Cinderella man. There's, this is a common trope in civilization, at least Western civilization, the Cinderella story. So when you look at the fact that the Noah narrative is um, clearly a, a version of a commonly told legend myth, you know, in the literary sense of the word myth, um, then you answer the, you have a whole different way of viewing why it was written. Um, you know that it wasn't, somebody wasn't writing down what they actually saw. They weren't writing down what was passed down to them from their great, great, great grandfather, Noah. Noah. Um, it was, uh, they, they were saying, this is a common story. We need to have our own version of it that um, describes our God differently. And that's where we get to, we just looked at the similarities. The differences are largely in how the deity within the story is portrayed. Um, as you saw, the the character and the events are pretty similar, but the the purpose of the story for the Jewish audience was to show that their God um, is different than other gods. Um, for the most part, in uh, the purpose of the flood, it, it's as in Genesis, it's like divine judgment, as we kind of are familiar with, on corrupt, violent humanity, right. and then God wants to start afresh with Noah and his family. Um, but in Gilgamesh and the Atrahasis epic, it's much more of, um, it's a lot more fickle. Like the gods are, they're basically just dealing with overpopulation and they are, they, they feel like humans are too noisy and disrupting their rest. So it's just, it's population control. Um, so it's, so in that case, the Jews were wanting to portray God as more, much more calculated and more like responsible in the decision. Obviously we could have a long conversation about whether we agree with that decision. And also, to put another layer on top, just because the Jews are attributing God with this decision doesn't actually mean God made that decision because, again, this story did not literally happen. All that literally happened was potentially a a large local flood that started all of these narratives to begin with. There's no need to actually think that God had any intervention or any part in that any more than God had a part in, you know, the tsunami of 2000. I know. When, what year was it? Five? was that? 2005? 2008? Um, Is this... 2008 is too recent, I think. Is this kind of like, I think I might have, I think I might have stumbled on uh, an analogy, metaphor here. Is this kind of like, uh, I think TikTok sort of started this, but Instagram reels, you could do it now as well, but the idea of someone makes a sound or someone uses a sound and then they make an original video with it. Usually it started out as like a dance, right? And so someone does that. And then the next thing you know, you're 12 layers deep into it and someone is doing a dance of the dance of the dance. You know, so it's these multiple yeah. layers to where you, you're like, you, you, would, you don't have to know the original to, to kind of get a little bit what's going on or something. But if you only had that one, you wouldn't know all the way back to like the original <laughs> TikTok <laughs> sound that started it all. Yeah, but everyone true. sort of has to come up with their own take on it. And everyone adds their little flair to it to show their personality or to show what's different about them and their channel or whatever you call it on TikTok. Um, but it's all kind of based off this original sound, this original trend that's, that's happening. Um, so similarly, there's a there's a flood that happened and one of these people groups writes a a story to kind of tell 
why you know what the significance is for them and their people group and then the other people are like well we you know we'll do that i'll i'll uh what do you call it on tiktok re re tiktok no i don't know what you but i'll i'll make i'll use that sound i'll use that story and i'll make my story off of that with my mm-hmm. tweaks and my twists um that's that's the analogy that came to my head <laughs> that's a pretty good analogy i like it i like it um in the the differences that we were talking about and what make these stories. Yeah. Like I'm going to make it unique. I'm going to make it my own, just like your TikTok analogy. Um, another, the way that the gods are portrayed differently is in the, the aftermath of the flood. Um, as we know in Genesis, God makes a covenant with Noah, with the rainbow says, I will never again destroy, um, the world with a flood in the other two versions. There's no covenant, uh, in Gilgamesh, the gods regret their decision afterwards. And then in the Atrahasis epic, they the gods realize that it's just not a pra- practical means of population control. So they institute other, other measures. Um, so it's a lot less of a relational um, kind of a interaction between the gods and the humans. And we could maybe leave humans feeling a lot more at risk, which the Jews were wanting to prevent. Um, again, if you're, if you're feeling up in arms of like, wait, that's, you know, God's still not any better for making a covenant to, to not wipe out the the earth again. Um, again, I'll bring you back to this did not actually happen. Uh, and you know, as heretical as it maybe sounds to say, like God didn't actually do this. Like this is a story that's giving God a role to try and portray God in a certain way that seems better than the, the other cultures nearby. But this is, again, a reinterpretation of someone else's story. They're putting their own God in place of someone else's God and giving them motives and new actions to try and explain what, what they believe about God. I right. mean, I could make up a story. Any of us could make up a story today that I was, I'm trying to think of now a good example of like if we do. Are we familiar with any other stories from other cultures? Uh, if we were to take a story, you know, this would be called. Um, cultural appropriation today or something. But if we were to take a story from, say, Hinduism and just swap out um, one of their main gods for our god and kind of retell the story and like, what what would Jesus do? What would our god do in this situation? That's essentially what they're doing. They're just putting mm-hmm. their Yahweh in an already a pre-existing story and changing it according to how they think Yahweh would handle the situation. And it, it maybe isn't the way we would write it. Um, probably isn't. Like if we were going to rewrite it today, we would see Yahweh as, you know, we would want him to not have a flood at all or like have everyone get on the boat or something like that. So we would write it differently. But they wrote it this way because of the culture and the time they were in. Um, it was also, you know, a t- uh, I'd say that we're maybe a little more like sensitive to maybe love and justice and such today in a different way. Like they were, it was just a much more, uh, you know, what dog eat dog kind of world back then. And mm-hmm. I think they were something like this wasn't as horrifying to them as it would have been to us. Also, because they knew it was not a literal story. It's, it's, uh, it's teaching something. And what they chose to teach from it was who they see God as. Right. Okay. So then the short answer to Haley's question in this story is what's the point? What what am I supposed to still hold on to? I guess the, the answer then for this story is, well, there's there there could potentially be something for you to hold on to. I guess but but there might not be. And and I think uh mm-hmm. that's a that's another change that's gonna have to take place as you yep, approach absolutely. these scriptures. We were told this book Every everything in this book. I mean, I remember looking at specific words in such great detail, zooming in on them and wanting to know all the context on that exact word. And some of that's fine. Some of that's great. But we were told, and I used to teach that that this that everything in this book has uh, you know, tremendous purpose for my life and for mm-hmm. like my day. And uh, and so I could I can flip open to any of these stories and I could learn and and glean <laughs> um a pretty a pretty amazing message for my life a pretty specific thing that i can i can install into my psyche and then live my life in accordance with that and that 
there there are aspects of scripture and um, you know teachings of Jesus and things like that, that that you could probably do that with, and it would have a pretty big impact on your life, and it would could potentially change how you live and that kind of thing. It doesn't mean that every single thing that you read in scriptures uh, of any kind are going to have that impact on your life. So that's that is a that is a massive change, and I think for those of us who were who who believed that. Um, it feels like, this is what I mean, that um, being handed a new meaning feels very unsatisfying because you're going, well, then that's not as significant as it used to be. So what's the point here? Yes, 100%. That's such an essential um, concept, I think, to wrap our minds around is, yeah, because we were taught that every word of this is um, deeply meaningful, inspired by God. And um, it doesn't have to be. And the purpose for which the people maybe wrote this story and retold this story maybe just doesn't have the same weight today, the same place and need today as it used to. Um, maybe the main purpose of us re-examining Noah today is just to to understand a bit more about the people who wrote it. If It, it does make me appreciate um, the Jewish culture and the Jewish perspective of God that they would take a story that is so you know, horrifying. And they would try to try to make it better, essentially, try to portray their, like they did want to portray their God as a God that was more just and more loving than the the story that existed. The story doesn't feel just or loving to us today, but um, by comparison, like it was more just and more loving than than what existed before. So in that sense, like that is something to at least give us um, appreciation for the people who were writing and reinterpreting um, these stories. It doesn't have to necessarily teach us anything about God. And this is where it gets um, a little, I think, wild to try and wrap our minds around, is that the Bible doesn't necessarily tell us anything about God as much as it tells us what people have thought about God. And we get to take those conclusions and decide what we want to do with them. But what people have thought about God is relatively subjective. And I mean, that's that's a kind of scary thought. But the reality is all we have are people's stories, people's ideas um, of who they saw God as in their time and culture. And that's 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 what those stories do. They they aren't written by God. God doesn't necessarily even give them a stamp of approval. And these stories could theoretically have been written even if God didn't exist. So we have to take them and decide what we're what we're going to do with them and how we want to use them in our lives. Those are some big statements right there. And I think to some people, they're going to be going, yes, yes. And then to others, they're going to be going, wait a minute, or clicking the podcast off. Um, it's two different ways of, of understanding what these texts are. And I, I think to someone who, who says that's not, you know, this this is the literal word of God. What are you doing, right? To the answers in Genesis um, crowd, uh, I think you have to you have to wrestle with the fact that of of what it, we're saying here is like there are other there are other flood narratives um, that existed before this one. So, what are you going to do with those? How are you going to wrestle with that? I think another lesson that was taught. Uh, through this, whether indirectly or, or directly, for me, a takeaway was be willing to look crazy based on what God is asking you to do in your life, even if everyone around is, is you know, calling you <laughs> an idiot, calling you crazy, um, because Noah built this ark for years and years and years before it had ever rained. He was building a boat. And so what is God asking you to, to do in your life that everyone around you is saying, that's crazy, but I'm going to do it anyway because I'm I'm trusting God, and ultimately, in the end, they're going to look crazy. You're going to look sane, kind of a thing. Um, mm-hmm. That that is one of the ways that the story has been interpreted, um, and that's something to acknowledge. It's something to because I know there's mm-hmm. many out there who have probably heard that and felt that with this story. Yeah, and I mean, you can still kind of read them. Um, 
in almost an Aesop's fable kind of a way. Like you can have small takeaways from different parts of the story. Like even the, the part of the story where they send out the dove to to test the waters. Like that's been used as a, uh, you know, at a, a small lesson for, for different things in life. And those can be used that way. Like just because, you know, you don't have to take the whole whole story and you can you can even not like the story and still have little things that you're like, oh, that's kind of an interesting you know, lesson or interesting thing that that person did, regardless of whether it actually happened. Like that's not the that's not the key here. Yeah, and I think where that message sort of comes from is from you know the Hall of Faith, Hebrews eleven, uh, by faith Noah, when warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear built an ark ark to save his family. By by his faith, he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness that is in keeping with faith. That's where you get that message, right? Um, it's So to someone reading the story this way, they're like, look, it says it at the beginning in Genesis. It says it here towards the end in, in Hebrews. That is what the story is. It, it connects it there. It was, it was a faith thing. It was God asked him to do this thing. And so he did it, um, even though he looked crazy. And look, he wasn't crazy in the end because God did flood the earth. Which, of course, again, is just an interpretation. God, there's there's no reason we have to think that God actually asked Noah to do those things, or that Noah was even a, a real figure. But And there's actually more to, to know about Noah as a figure. That's pretty interesting, and we'll maybe talk about that another time, maybe on our second podcast, Utterly Heretical. But um, to wrap it up, to Haley, um, to answer a bit of that question, um, I don't, as we've talked about many times, I don't think we can answer it with one answer because the Bible is not one book. Like there, there are different texts throughout this library of scriptures that are going to have more meaning than others. Um, I personally think that, you know, the gospels are probably the most significant texts that I would want to be part of my life. And I, I, other than being interested in the academics behind the story of Noah, it's probably not going to play a big role in my life. And not all of these stories have to. Um, You're allowed to to read them and find what feels deeply meaningful and helpful in your life and what creates a better world. And you don't have to continue reading and incorporating stories that don't don't feel that way. Uh, It's it's a weird way to go about reading scriptures because it's something we're not used to. But I mean, we're talking about texts that were written, you know, two, three thousand years ago. We don't you know, we don't see the Epic of Gilgamesh as something that you know, it's supposed to be deeply meaningful for our life. And in the same way, the story of Noah doesn't need to be either. And that's why when it's all bound together in one, with one piece of leather, right? And the, so you have Genesis and you have Hebrews there. It's like, well, look, it's all in the same book. And even though people know, I think that it's not literally the same book, um, it's pretty hard. I mean, we, it's we're very hard to separate out the it together. mindset. Yeah. Correct. So, um, which Shelby is writing a book about this, just a dun, dun, teaser. Dun. Um, so be watching for that over the next year or so. Um, but that that's going to always be a challenge. And so um, it, it, it's going to be, and I've said this before, you see it one way until you don't see it that way anymore. And then, so it, it and this is what makes those conversations, I think, between someone who sees it this way and someone who doesn't see it this way or who sees it another way. And maybe this is just a life lesson um, <laughs> with our divided world that we live in now, but it's very hard to bridge those gaps in conversation and relationally. Um, it's like, hey, let's get into this. Let's talk about that. You know, it, it's going to be very difficult to have that conversation. So have a lot of um, grace <laughs> for yourself in, mm-hmm. in that um, for someone out there on either side of that. Like, I need to talk to my kids who are going off the deep end and thinking about the Bible. They're like losing it. They're thinking that that they can just kind of pick and choose the Bible. If you're listening to this, I don't want to say hate listening to almost radical, but if you're like listening, looking for the the issues and the problems with what we're saying, or if you're you out there like- You probably got plenty of them from this Oh episode. yeah, you, you got a whole notebook full of them, you know? Or if you're someone that's like, I think I might, I don't know, trying to get up the courage to send this episode to like a family member who does not, or a friend who does not see things this way and thinks the Bible is this, you know, complete um, story that points to Jesus- um, then that just have a lot on either side of that, just have a lot of grace for yourself because it, it doesn't often go well. And I'm, I don't just mean that people are like going to freak out and flip out. That could happen, but it doesn't go well in that, you know, what are your goals going into this? It's really hard to convince and to change someone's mind. And that's why I say you see something 
a certain way until you just don't see it that way anymore or until something it's I, I really believe it's it's like an outside force that acts upon you it's something that doesn't add up or doesn't make sense it's this it, it and then and then through that process you're like you know what and then i mean all the stories i've heard of someone starting to change on something it's not you know someone sent me this video someone sent me this episode uh, that there are those stories out there but i think far more it's this work that someone does internally it's it's something that uh, that happens and they it doesn't add up it doesn't work anymore and they're like wait a minute you know and then they start thinking and they st- they start seeking it out um, but it's like something has to change or click it's like a switch that happens first um, and then and then it's like an openness i guess that comes with like i'm even i'm just i'm i'm relearning i'm revisiting i hear this all the time from people from people that i thought would never uh, be open to to kind of relearning or rethinking something um doesn't mean they've like completely thrown out the Bible, but they've rethought a topic. Just the other day, someone was telling me, someone who I never would have thought would have maybe changed on complementarian or uh, complementarianism or egalitarianism and women teaching in church. Like they were like, I- I'm, I think I see it that way now. And um, I'm, you know, <laughs> that's, that's where I am. And I was like, wow, that's awesome. So that's, it's, it, everyone's on a process. Everyone's on a journey. And, um, and we're here for, for everyone on all those journeys, for the people out there that are like, it's not almost heretical. It's totally heretical. You know, where I'm here for those. Like we get those comments on uh, the Facebook or the, uh, we get those Apple podcast reviews. Um, so yeah, <laughs> go leave a review if you want to. Uh, but we also know that there are so many people and I've get these emails a lot where people are like, I mean, when I started listening to Almost Heretical two or three years ago, I hated what you guys were doing and now I see it. Now I get it. And it's just everyone's on a journey, right? Everyone's on a journey. So the hope is that we can have um, grace for people. There's where grace comes in. <laughs> we can have grace for people that are on their journey. I, I truly believe that everyone is is trying the best with what they have. Mm-hmm. That for the most part, people are not evil beings. Um, this is another change that's happened to me. I used to believe everyone was evil from the start, and they were separated from God and all this kind of stuff. And now I believe that everyone is is actually they're trying to do the best with with what they have and with what they know, and they're trying to be loving and be kind and be, you know, and and it doesn't feel like that to a lot of people. Sure. Um, for people that maybe disagree with your life or disagree with something that you're doing or the way you think about something. But I really believe that's the motive of, of most people Mm -hmm. out there. And so have grace for each other as we're trying to figure this all out together. And we're trying to live amongst people who think differently than we do and, um, think differently than you do. And this is, uh, I could probably say this any year, but this is an election year. Um, and so it's going to just ramp up again and people on both sides and uh, it, it's going to get, it's going to get messy. And that probably applies. Someone listening to this in four years is like, it's another election year. And he was speaking into the future. It's always like that. This is the most important election of our lives, right? Just have grace for each other. That sounds like the end of a sermon. Wow. <laughs> I landed the plane. <laughs>